Let's uh, address the se second topic, which uh, talks about two key ingredients needed to bring safe and effective cell therapy to every patient in need, and that's namely cell characterization and scalable manufacturing. Uh, our next speaker is really the most qualified to speak about that, uh, Chris Roy, who is the uh, uh, Milton Chair. I've forgotten what chair it was. You have so many titles, Chris. The Milton Chair, uh, the Director of the NSF Engineering Research Center for Cell Manufacturing Technologies, the Director of the Marcus Center for Cell Therapy Characterization and Manufacturing and at Georgia Tech, and the Technical Lead for the National Cell Manufacturing Consortium. Chris. Thank you. Um, thank you, Fred, and thank you, Janet, and everyone else for um, inviting uh, me here. I'm going to talk uh, from an engineer standpoint. I, I'm almost going to guess that I'm probably one of the very, very few engineers in this room. Uh, and so um, uh, how do you take these promising therapies? There are a few here. There are many uh, outside of this uh, few that you have heard of. And how do you actually make them into a product? Because if you are going to treat 100,000 patients, a million patients, 10 million patients, that needs to be an industrial product. And so we work very closely with industry, we work very closely with uh, many uh, partners to think about that. So I'll, I'll talk a little bit about that in a few minutes to have. So the fundamental problem, and we got to take a step back, and I'm really talking about cell therapies and regenerative medicine here, is that we are probably for the first time in human history trying to large scale manufacture a living product, something that is living, that is completely different from boats and auto automobiles and everything else that are inanimate objects. We are fantastic at manufacturing those. We never have large scale manufactured a living product that changes its properties with every manipulation we make. I take a cell from this petri dish, put it there, it changes. Whether that change is <coughs> relevant or not, I don't think we know yet. So let's think about that as a product. This is a very complex product. We have the cell, which itself is a complex system. It has proteins, DNA, RNA, lipids, carbohydrates. Any one of them would be a drug by itself. So when we are putting a cell in, we are literally putting probably anywhere between 100 to 1,000 drugs at the same time in the same patient without really knowing very well what it's going to do or each of those components are going to do and what they do collectively in that patient. We have the manufacturing process. And as I said, you change the manufacturing process, you change the product. And then we have the patient, and in which patient, um, I'm sorry, uh, and in which patient this is most effective is still fairly unknown. And we need to really think about one particular cell is not going to be treating every disease out there and in every patient. So we need more knowledge. And, and that is that whole process of creating this multi scale complex system. So we first started this with a grant from NIST through the Advanced Manufacturing Program. This is uh, a roadmap, and I think you uh, have a copy of that roadmap uh, outside on the, on the table. Uh, we worked with uh, over 16 universities and 25 plus industry members and many members from the FDA and NIH and the government uh, to provide uh, sort of thought leadership in this process, which resulted in this uh, roadmap that we published in 2016 uh, and then updated in 2017, and a new update is going to come out uh, this fall, where we really thought about what are the challenges and barriers in that scalable production of promising cell therapies as we go along. And there is a laundry list of things that industry wanted us to do to de-risk them and to actually deliver the promise of these things uh, to millions of people around the world. And I'll try to summarize a few of these here. Um, and if I don't get through my other slide, this is probably the most important slides here. The, it is, to me, a question of quality, quality, quality. And that relates to safety, that relates to efficacy. The quality control and quality assurance that are in place currently has probably very little to do with the function of those cells in a particular patient group. So we need to do better. We very little know the mechanism of action of these complex, quote unquote, drugs in a particular disease or a particular patient population. When you go to manufacture something in the traditional pharmaceutical manner, you need to have what are called quality attributes. So when, when I talk to industry and say, you know, what do you really need? Do you need the know-how how to make vats and vats of this so you can treat a million patients? They said, no, just tell me what do I need to do to control quality that I have the safest product 
every batch I make, everywhere I make around the world, right? So that measurement of quality attributes is still undefined in many of the therapies that we do. And how does that manufacturing process affect that quality? This is, again, in a chemical engineer's term called critical process parameters. We must know process parameters so we can control them, we can fix them, so out comes a product that is very defined. I am always given this example. You go and buy an aspirin here or in Atlanta or in Thailand or in India, you get the same thing every time, pretty much the same thing every time. You get that, do that, try to do that for cell therapy, you're not going to get that same thing every time. And what is that parameter that we need to define um, and work on? I think uh, Tony mentioned workforce, uh, and I cannot, cannot overemphasize how critical workforce development is. Right now, one of the biggest challenges this nascent industry faces, and many of the clinical center faces, is appropriately trained workforce. Not just undergraduate and graduate degree holders, but technical college degree holders, which forms the backbone of this nation's manufacturing workforce. I'll give you the example in the state of Georgia. Probably hundreds of technical colleges, only three even have a biotechnology program, we are not churning up enough trained specialists to deliver this promise to our patients. And then there is this whole area of um, monitoring, how do we create donor and patient variability, so we can go on and on. A lot of this is in the slides I provided, so I'm not going to go um, through that very much. Where are the opportunities? There is a huge opportunity for data sciences and artificial intelligence, and this is gradually getting into the regenerative medicine field. We have a very complex cell, we have a very complex patient, and what properties of the cells act in which patient and in which disease is a very complex problem that I think data scientists can help, and this is a national priority right now in the nation. So I think there is great leverage that can be taken. Uh, automation. Automation has to come. A lot of it is because we want reproducible products and uh, safe products every time, and, and how do we bring that in? Um, and one thing for those of you who are in the business community would agree that supply chain and logistics is absolutely clear for any product that we manufacture in this country and try to deliver to millions of people around the world. Right now, if I take one ingredient of my cell culture and that company goes down, the whole production has to stop and then the patient doesn't get their therapies. That doesn't happen for the iPhone you use. You get one little thing crashed, there is a backup option that triggers in. Right now, we have an extremely poor supply chain in this industry, in this nascent <coughs> industry, so you really cannot even think of, even the FDA-approved product companies cannot even think of treating a million patients or even 100,000 patients at the same time, right? So we got to uh, think about that. Um, the other area, so I, I really wanted to thank the National Science Foundation uh, because they had the foresight to fund uh, really a bunch of engineers working with clinicians and policy experts and biologists um, to, for this Center for Cell Manufacturing Technologies, which I have the privilege to direct. This is an eight-university consortium around the country, few international partners in Canada, in Ireland, and in Japan, um, and really coming together over probably 50 principles investigators to say, you know, what are new technologies that we need to develop to get these promising therapies into actual reality of treating many, many patients around the world. Uh, and also to the Marcus Foundation, because they had come in with a philanthropic gift to us as well to exactly answer the same question. So this is a true public-private partnership uh, where both philanthropy and federal funding has come in. But I would tell you, you know, one thing uh, I, I say uh, quite a bit is that a lot of other countries has gone ahead of us. I think some of that was brought earlier. Um, Canada, Japan, UK has really invested tremendous amount of this, um, and many US companies are going to them to find solutions uh, for their next product, and that is really not helpful uh, for our country. Um, so what do we work on? Three areas. What do we need to measure for quality? This is still a big unknown answer, and quality that is predictive of its uh, performance in a particular patient. How do we measure it? So what are the tools and technologies needed? And how do we take this therapy, scale it up to a 100,000 patient, a million patient, or a 10 million patient? And really the output, uh, we talked a little bit about standards at the beginning. There is very little standardization right now uh, in that that we need to work 
work on. Um, and so there are a lot of efforts going in in this process. I want to end with two things. There are quite a few uh, thought leadership going in this. The National Academy has a forum on regenerative medicine that, that I'm a part of. Um, and the standards coordinating body, and then there are other organizations that are looking into standards. And there are uh, you know, international discussions happening, for example, at the Vatican, for example, um, that really asks about access. Who are these therapies going to be accessible to? Is it uh, just for the rich few uh, in the richest countries of the world, or is it for everyone in rural America uh, or everywhere else? So we need to think about these issues as we go along. So I'll stop there and leave that slide up there for you to read through. Thank you.